any time the hour goes above one, it could potentially signal the beginning of the third wave. If we look at low and middle income countries and see how they're doing on vaccination, we are actually doing pretty well as proportions. Where we are predicting the Delta variant to land means that we need to be immunizing above 80, probably 85% of our population. How concerning is this R rate, which is above one in eight states across the country? And does it signal the beginning of a third beginning? Well, anytime the R goes above one, it could potentially signal the beginning of the third wave. The R rate really measures transmission. So it is about how many infections one person is passing on to more people in their communities. And any time it is above one, that is an infection that will continue to grow in the population. If we look at R0, which is written as R0, that is the rate of spread that you have when the entire population is completely naive, everybody is completely susceptible. And for SARS-CoV-2, that R0 has been calculated originally to be about 2.5. And then we had the alpha variant, which was 1.6 times more transmissible. And then we have the delta variant, which is 1.6 more times more transmissible, or you don't know transmissible, but it spreads more easily. And that gives you a potential R0 of somewhere between 6.5 and 8. So that is, has been reduced to an effective reproductive number, which again, we want to try and keep below one, but is just above one in some states. So essentially it's a signal that you need to do something about. The other thing that's important to remember is where are you measuring R? You know, what is contributing to that number? If you are measuring R in the general community and it is 1.2, you really do need to worry a lot about it. If you're doing more targeted testing, if you're looking specifically at controls, if you're looking at people who have symptoms, then you don't worry so much about it being above one because that's actually not representative of spread in the general population. In a sense, the second wave sort of never really went down in Canada. Now, uh, one of the reasons being offered is that it has the lowest uh, zero prevalence, which is rough around 44%. And so it has a large susceptible pool of people who may get uh, the virus. Is that, is that explanation enough to explain what's happening in Canada or are there other factors at work? It is a reasonable explanation for what's happening in Kerala. Kerala certainly has a large proportion of the population that is susceptible. It's also a state where population density is relatively high. So I think what, has, what the seropositivity rate shows us, and it's important to emphasize that that seropositivity is likely to be a bit of an underestimate and that it is contributed both by people who have been infected and by people who have been vaccinated. So among those who are vaccinated, you expect protection. Among those who are infected, you expect protection. But you also have to understand that there may be a proportion of people that are protected but not testing positive in the zero surveys because of the weaning of antibodies. What proportion that is, we don't know at the moment, but it is safe to say that Kerala has a larger susceptible population as a proportion of the total compared to other states. 
Right now, given that it has this large susceptible population, and uh, uh, you know, so what should our strategy be? Do we let the virus then sort of run free in this population? What are what are the measures that Kerala needs to seriously be taking at this moment? The routine public health measures, which are making sure that you're tracking and isolating people who are testing positive, monitoring them, becomes very important to do. And Kerala has done a reasonable job of doing that. And as you have more cases, you need to ramp up efforts to do that even more. Then you have to make sure that you prevent crowding. The Kerala had decided to open up for Eid, which was a, not a good public health decision. And Onam's coming, so they need to be careful that they don't relax around that time. The other thing to do is to really push vaccination. Supplies are short, but you know, this morning I was reading that Tamil Nadu has decided that it is going to focus its vaccination program on the states, on the districts where the zero prevalence is lowest. And that is a very sensible approach to take. Absolutely. And is that an approach that the country as a whole needs to be taking at this moment? You know, sort of target those areas where zero prevalence is low, prevent infections from entering those areas. Is that something that the country needs to be doing? You know, and our state's doing enough of that right now. So I think with this pandemic, we are all learning. And what bothers me is that we are not experimenting enough and not documenting enough. What we could do is when you have a question like this, should we really vaccinate more in places that have lower zero prevalence? Should we be vaccinating, you know, not by giving supplies that are equitably distributed across districts, but identify, let's say, hard to reach areas and do a blanket vaccination in those areas? I think these are the things that should be experiments that the program does. And then we should be documenting the results as in monitoring these areas after a period of time and saying, did it bring disease down? What do we use as a control? Where did we do things differently that will allow us to figure out whether the approaches that we are taking have worked or not? Dr. Khan, do we... Do we know what the genuine fears that this wave or this number that you're seeing in certain parts of the country is not linked to a new variant? Do we have enough uh, confidence to say that much or is that too early? I think it's a little bit too early and we should be looking where cases are concentrated. We should be doing saturation sequencing there, um, especially for outbreaks. Now, where Kerala is concerned, I know that they have been doing more sequencing than most states, even before Ensacog was set up. One of the key Ensacog scientists has been supporting the Kerala government for, I think it's almost a year to get sequencing done. And that's how they've been able to study many of their big breakthrough cases just the way the IGIB was able to study breakthroughs that happened in Delhi also. I wanted to get a sense from you. How do you see uh, the next future waves playing out? You know, the experts would say that, you know, you would not see such a huge number of cases in places that have already suffered a lot during the second wave. So uh, as someone who's uh, sort of looking at all of this, how do you see this uh, wave or any future we playing out? Well, I think it all depends on variants and how much we allow variants to emerge and to spread undetected. Because, you know, the time to control an infection is early. And if we begin to look at variants now, if you can identify a variant quickly, then you can restrict its spread. And if you restrict its spread, allow it to die out, it doesn't take over the world. So that's the key thing. You have to sequence in real time and you have to act on that sequencing data in real time. 
Now, this can be hard because sequencing alone doesn't tell you what is dangerous. And that's why it's very important that whenever we look at sequencing data, it must be integrated with epidemiological data and with clinical information. What's happening to the people who were infected with this variant? Were they sicker? Did they pass it on to more people? How much virus are they shedding? How long are they shedding virus? What can we learn as quickly as possible about the behavior of this new variant in vaccinated individuals, in unvaccinated individuals? A lot for us to learn, and it can only happen if we have like a rapid response force, but to investigate uh, these infections. You know, what you've just said, this is what's happening with uh, the Delta variant in large parts of the world, right, where the unvaccinated population is getting largely impacted and um, you're seeing huge rising number of, of cases in places that did not have, that do have actually pretty decent vaccination rates. In India, vaccination remains very, very sluggish. Um, Given what we know, what do we do? What strategies do we adopt to sort of prevent the, the you know, complete uh, situation from getting to where it was maybe two, three months ago? So I think, you know, the question is what's sluggish? If we look at low and middle income countries and see how they're doing on vaccination, we are actually doing pretty well as proportions. We are absolutely doing well in terms of numbers, right? We're giving out 5 million doses a day, and that's not a negligible amount, right? So I think we are keeping pace with supply. The problem really is there isn't enough supply. You can't change that overnight. Every effort that can be put in place to increase supply has been put in place. And what we have to do is make sure that we keep using doses as they are made. But until we get people vaccinated, we are going to need to continue to have non-pharmaceutical interventions. Masks are not going to go away. Ventilation is going to continue to be critical. And I think the important thing to recognize is that between the vaccination and between the kind of horror of the second wave that we saw, where we had such a high rate of infection in the country, we are actually not in as bad a position as many other places are. Again, if you get a variant that breaks through prior immunity, then we'll be back where we started. But hopefully that will not happen. You said this earlier, you know, there was a zero prevalence data from ICMR that said that in India, 60 to 70 percent of the population has uh, been exposed to the virus. And, uh, and yet that figure is not enough to sort of uh, get us that famed herd immunity and the population remains at risk. So uh, I just wanted to understand why is that figure also not good enough? Back to your reproductive number. So your herd immunity threshold, as it's called, is uh, basically dependent on how transmissible, how easily a virus spreads within a community. And if your reproductive number for the virus, the base uh, reproductive number, the R0, goes up, then your herd immunity threshold goes up as well. And the, where we are predicting the Delta variant to land means that we need to be immunizing above 80, probably 85% of our population. And given that a large proportion of our population is young, we are not going to be able to reach herd immunity without vaccinating children at least getting down to 12-year-olds. And then we'll have to have very, very high vaccine coverage in adults. We don't have that at the moment. Our numbers are creeping upwards, but we have a very long way to go. 
The other thing to remember is that herd immunity is not an on-off switch. It's not like it'll kick in suddenly. What we are seeing already with 67% protection by and large is a slower spread of a very, very infectious variant. So to some extent, you are seeing the impact of having part of your population protected and it will get better as you get closer to 85%.